this computer. All right, there should be a dot. Does it show? Yeah, okay, yep. there it is. So <laughs> welcome. This is the first episode of Table Talks, what I'm calling Table Talks. Um, a segment for therapists, about therapists, for therapists, by therapists, and students and teachers. And I wanted to introduce you to Lori DiGiulio, who I met. Who did I meet you? Oh, I, yeah, you hosted one of my seminars. And through NKT. We met through kind of through NKT. Uh, that's right. Yeah. And, and, um, and then I, I um, stayed with you in Nova Scotia back in 2016 and, and then so on and so forth, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Anyway, I wanted to find out more about you and, and, and your path and, and uh, maybe start with just a little bit of your background. How did you end up becoming a therapist or were you always a therapist? Um, I actually wanted to go into medicine oh. and um, I just, I found that that allopathic route just didn't fit with me. Um, it didn't provide me, I think, with what I really wanted to do as a practitioner and I was a smarty pants. So I finished high school a little early and my parents said, you have to get a job or you have to go to school. And I didn't want to go back to high school for no reason <laughs> or back to college or back to anything else. And um, so I said, I'll just take some courses. And um, I took some general interest courses because I also didn't want to get a job. I was too young. <laughs> and um, I took some general inter interest courses and one of them was in massage. Um, it was a local clinic that was offering kind of an introduction to massage for yourself, for partners. And that's kind of how I got into it. Um, wow. Yeah. How old were you then? Young. I was just out of high school and um, I was born earlier. So I was probably at that time. Um, 16 or 17. Wow. wow. Yeah. You really yeah. had a, a, a path kind of, you know, just the, the little that I know of you, but more from spending time with you, there's a, almost a spiritual part of you that seems to be guided rather than making um, um, strategic choices. Would, would that be true for you? Or? Um, I think that people would most likely say, um, or see that I have a very um, logical, pragmatic side to me. Um, but definitely a lot of things in my life have happened just by coincidence or whatever. Kind of yeah, well, want to use there. yeah, whatever you want to call that. <laughs> <laughs> what was, I mean, you know, I guess since 2016 and you, your path kind of led you back and forth to different places. Like I met you in Nova Scotia. No, wait. The NKT, where was that? Toronto? Did we? I don't know if we met at a course. It would have been in Toronto. Um, okay. Or well, met online. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I anyway, but I, you know, when I did finally spend time with you in Tahir, um, um, you, you kind of went from East Coast to Alberta, and now you're in Alberta? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I started my practice in Ontario as a massage therapist and I, um, I owned a clinic there. Um, and then when I met my partner, he was in Wasega beach Collingwood area. Mm. And so I divided my time. I'd been teaching at colleges at that time. And so I had this clinic that I was running and then I would drive out to Collingwood, this Wasega beach area. And I started working with, um, who I always say is the most amazing chiropractor and personal trainer I've ever met. Um, and they were a really great influence because I had gone from owning a clinic, um, man, that um, some people can do it really well, but I found that it, it took so much of my time um, that I wasn't able to be a practitioner as much as I had liked to um, yeah. because I was in the business so much. Yeah. And so moving away from that was kind of, it was hard, but it was the greatest gift because it gave me the time to explore myself as a practitioner rather than worrying about who's in this room, who's in that room, all the logistics of running a business, right? Yeah. We, we mirror each other almost word for word on that. Yeah. It was really tough for me. Um, I, I'm really not a strategic thinker and then I would look to people that were smarter than me and, and, and look for their ideas and, and uh, 
it would take weeks or months before I realized, you know, it's not just a, it's not, not a bad idea. It's just not a good fit for me. So mm -hmm. I, I know exactly what you mean on that. What was the most important part about wanting to be a therapist? Well, you know, therapist rather than a business person. Um, I think that I, I think the reason why I wanted to own a business is because I couldn't, I couldn't find the fit of people that I really wanted to work with. Um, not that I was working with people that were terrible, but I, I really wanted to create my, my own thing with the people that I wanted surrounding me. And when I got into it, I realized that all the bills of owning a big business um, prevent you from really being able to pick and choose unless you're independently wealthy. Yeah, you can just yeah. wait around for the right people, right? Um, and I kind of had not the pressure at all, um, but I had a little bit of um, unconscious pressure of my father being a really successful entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that kind of pushed me into something that I was never really good at. Yeah. My business didn't fail. I, I had the clinic open for 10 plus years, um, but I'm not a business person. Yeah. What a relief, eh? <laughs> right? When you find, I wish it didn't take me 10 years to realize that, but it's okay. You opened up a thought there for me that, that, that struck me uh, that I, I often struggle with. You know, I'm fascinated by all the different techniques and I, you know, I, I met you on one of these new techniques. When you do take a uh, a course, whether it was NKT or whatever, from the time you started being a therapist or a clinic owner, what were the difficulties in implementing that, or did you have difficulties? In implementing like a new learned technique? Yeah, all your clients are so used to you being, you know, this way, hands on, and all of a sudden, whoop, you... Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I didn't super experience that, only because, um, I was in Ontario, practice, practiced as a massage therapist there for 14 years, and then it was at that time that I had just taken NKT Level 1, which is what kind of spurred the change of my practice. Um, I had a big disc injury that put me in surgery, so I had a little time off there, um, and then I moved. I moved to a new province, so I could kind of just reinvent myself, mm. um, and, and that was really <laughs> valuable. But then when I moved out of Nova Scotia, I had established my practice there and people knew how I practiced and came into Alberta. I, I did experience that. And that's why I stopped practicing in Alberta, went back to Nova Scotia. So right. technically my residence is in Alberta, but I work in Nova Scotia. Uh, yeah, that's for interesting. That reason. What a split. It's yeah. almost like a, would you call that like a cultural thing? Like not just Alberta, but where you are in Alberta, just not ready for that kind of thing? Maybe. Um, I think sometimes, though, um, I think that's something that I thought, too, that, oh, you know, you go to a small community and nobody has any idea about this and this. And I, I don't think that's true. I, I mean, I have been in really small communities in rural Nova Scotia where those people were just open to anything and were really open minded. And, I, and so I don't think it's that. No. Um, but I think it's this challenge of building any practice. Right. Yeah. yeah. Especially a practice that doesn't fit into the box. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm always interested. Um, I feel like I'm stealing people's thoughts and ideas when I ask them uh, in seminars. But I remember we touched on certain subjects, and I never wrote it down. But you had a like a a library of of books and people that kind of guided you. Are there are there some uh, sort of key um, names like teachers or itinerant teachers, you know, um, or, or books that you refer to often? I think I love books. I am a lover of books. So I do have a lot of books, but nowadays I don't really refer to books as much as I refer to kind of online resources. Yeah. But what I would say is that, you know, I did, um, a, uh, started a degree in, um, adult education through Brock University. Um, I ended up doing um, a few courses through Brock, but didn't find that it kind of met what I, I was looking for. But one of the books that I had to read in one of those courses was The Skillful Teacher. The Skillful Teacher was written by Brookfield. I, I don't remember his first name, um, but it was a really great read. It doesn't sound exciting, and it's definitely not in my kind of wheelhouse of anatomy, phys, alt movement. But it was a really great read because 
it taught me how to communicate with different types of learners. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important for ourselves too, to realize what kind of learner we are. Um, and then as teachers, both you and I teach, um, how, how to accommodate different learning styles. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm going to probably ask you after we finish recording, but maybe you'll, you can send me a, a list of those things and I can, um, uh, I can put it on the, I can put a, a list or a, a link to a list of the, the books that you might find interesting. And I think I'll do that with everybody because I have a list of my own, but I've never heard of that one. Mm -hmm. But it, um, you know, I think one of the things that attracted me to, to you and, and the way you, uh, present as a therapist and as a, or in the case of, um, you, you know, when I was teaching, the way you present yourself as a, as, a, as a learner was that your heart was open to just about anything. You know, you were really prepared to, to accept anything that came out of my mouth. And, it, you know, the room is really divided when I'm teaching. And, and um, I, you know, being a sensitive to energy, I was really aware of who was really like, you know, prove to me that this is and then the other part of the room that was just like lay it on me and and you were kind of right in there with just it was almost like my my onus was to to sort of feed myself off of you know you and Suzanne and other people that were really like there just for me and uh, and for yourself and um so the the question sort of from that was like with that open heart, was that the sort of thing that kind of guided you or gave you the strength or maybe the, the courage to, to become a teacher yourself? Or was that just like a natural progression? Man, I love that you're stroking my ego a little bit, Paul, but I got to be honest, I used to be a big jerk <laughs> um, with regards to all this openness to things. Um, and I, I had to learn that. I had to learn that there wasn't a better way, um, that there wasn't, you, you know, I think that I came from um, a space where I really loved the mechanical part of anatomy, of, of movement, um, of, of treating, um, and the kind of hardcore science that felt really good to me. Um, but then as I saw people practicing different types of practitioners and even now um, I'm doing some more work in applied kinesiology and indicator testing and stuff that I would never think that I would do. Um, I, I wasn't always like that um, and then I, I realized that when I when I went into learning different modalities and thinking oh my god everything that I have done up until now is garbage. I can't believe people continued to see me and it and this chiropractor i was working with said to me you know you were a good therapist before you learned all that new stuff oh wow so remember that thing lots of things work for there? lots of reasons right <laughs> yeah I, I i'm not sure whether that was a compliment i'm not sure how i heard that well, um no he it was absolutely he said i was struggling with this new technique that i was learning and and i i thought oh you know i just can't get this to work i can't get to the this to to do what i wanted it to do and he said you were a great therapist before you started this new technique yeah. go back to that you had great results you had and it made me realize that there wasn't a better thing that things work for for people for a multitude of reasons um psychic healing or intuitive healing works for people just because i can't touch it and make sense of it logically doesn't mean it can't work right. um and that's something that i really had to learn right. because i did I, I did feel like there were things that were better than and that's so would i would i be wrong i i was under an assumption from my you know that we never spoke about this but it was just it's just me i pick things up when i touch somebody mm -hmm. Um, you know, I can assume anything over the phone and I can assume anything from a, a regular conversation, but in, as soon as I touch somebody, something registers and, and things start to make sense. And I kind of picked that up with you that you are, and, and that's the question, are you, would you, would that resonate with you that you are, um, you know, a light worker, an energetic, a person that understands re registers or at least is a conduit of energy? Yes, but it's still very uncomfortable for me. 
Yeah. Those are two exclusively different things. And I, and I, I say that only because I, I fall into that same category. I've been like that since birth, but I still go, you know, something will pop up and it's an absolute truth. And then I go, nah, I can't possibly yeah. be right. You know, until, yeah. you know, it's in my face that it's like, okay, okay, okay. It, it's yeah. <laughs> I had, when I was just starting my practice, I had worked at a chiropractic clinic at a mall. So like a, it was like a strip mall. And I had been on lunch and I walked into the mall to grab some lunch. And this older man, he's probably like in his early eighties, maybe stopped me, Indian man. And he stopped me and he looked straight at me and he grabbed my hands and he says, you're a really, really powerful healer. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And, it was, and that was when I was probably in my early twenties. And I thought, mm, yeah. weird no touching my hands. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. But it's an uncomfortable feeling because I feel like, I feel like that is a lot of responsibility. <laughs> yeah, we're not used to uh, um, uh, accepting our own power, mm -hmm. our own personal power and what we're supposed to do with it or, or with the responsibility as you call it. So yeah. it's a challenge, eh? It is. That, that makes me wonder, I'm gonna go back to, um, well, well, I'm gonna move back from, from the, the must read list, we'll, we'll post that later, but, um, there, there's there's two things. Um, what were your biggest challenges? I was there's two things I was going to ask. What was your biggest challenge as a therapist, just sort of m moving through all of those stages? But then I I have to think about what were your biggest challenges as a clinic owner, and then I'll go back to you more personally as a business owner, as a clinic owner, as somebody trying to <clears throat> run an operation that was I don't know homogeneous like. This is my yeah. name and I want everybody in here, not necessarily to have the same t-shirt or something, but. Yeah, I really, just like you said, um, the reason why I did it is because I wanted everybody to be on the same page. I wanted to work with a team that was on the same page that had the same, you know, philosophies of care. Um, and I was just too young. Yeah. I should have never opened at that time. Um, I was maybe, 23, 24, uh, that was too young to open up a business that size anyway. 23 or 24. Yeah, I, I mean, and the biggest challenge was finding the people um, and keeping them. And so all my time was making sure people were happy, getting along, all of that stuff. Yeah. And, you know, to be quite honest, the bills prevented me from really mm -hmm. creating a team that I wanted. Um, and so, you know, at the beginning, I would walk into that space and feel so proud, just super, super proud. And then not so much. Yeah. The last few years, I, I would walk into that space and dread being there, <laughs> which sucks, right? Yeah. You just yeah. wake up to pay the rent. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I remember that, that, that pride. And I remember people thinking, you know, that it was awesome and me not thinking it was awesome at all. Exactly. But, you know, <laughs> I wonder, you know, I, I have asked other people and I did the same sort of follow the leader kind of thing and asked other clinic owners and they were, you know, I never really had that chance to kind of um, connect or touch, touch them in the same way energetically. And the response was very, was quite varied in there. Like there was something that went from pure authenticity, like you're saying, I tried really hard. I didn't fail. I mean, you were around for 10 years, uh, but it wasn't a great joy. I, I, my joy came from being a therapist to the bravado of I'm, you know, this is awesome. But also their clinics were, you know, expanding every year. They're getting bigger. So for sure. But, you know, their, their clinic time when I, and I would see them in clinic, I could tell when I finally did, you know, go and see them as a person, as a therapist, needing treatment that their half their brain was like you said half of your time was spent while working on somebody uh isn't someone opened the front door i, I wonder yeah. what you know somebody you know what's the it was just it was it was distracting from my my um my treatment but it it was also a learning experience and i thought oh i don't want to be like that and of course i became like that so <laughs> It's a good answer and I really appreciate it because I think there's going to be people that are watching this that eventually, you know, might be in that process of deciding. Yeah. You know, I've got to, 
my my thing was I my thing was I followed the money, and I had a, a billionaire um, uh, client who said, you know, you could make four or five times. I've done the math. You could make four times four or five times the money if you open a clinic and here's how to do it. And this is a formula and the formula was, you know, bulletproof, but mm -hmm. I, I wasn't ready and, and I was doing it out of ego and that's just not right for me. So me too. Out and, there is... yeah. And then what happens is you do it and people are impressed, right? They come just like you said, they, they're like, Oh my gosh, you're so young. You have a business. Oh, you must be so proud. Your parents must be proud. These people must be proud. You must be proud. I'm like, yeah, 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 I'm proud. Yeah, I'm up to here with it. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's a really valid question for a lot of people and, and whether they start. But if it doesn't come from the right place and you don't have your plan, it might be difficult to follow it through. And yeah. Mm. Did you ever, um, um, well, before that, I wanted, I guess I sort of, one of my first questions was, you know, taking new courses or new, taking in new information and then uh, applying it. Was there one challenge or something that you had to overcome to, to be able to be, to integrate it as, you know, I'm, I identify as a therapist doing this, and now poop, you've got this new thing in there, now I identify as this, and, and it's not just a tool in your toolbox, but it's like I use this new thing all the time, and you're, was there any, was there one thing that you had, the biggest challenge that you might have had? Yeah, I think, and it's still probably the biggest challenge is trying to explain to people how it's different and finding the words, the right words to use that describe who I am as mm -hmm. a therapist. Um, for billing purposes, I'm a massage therapist, but I feel like using those terms it yeah. just puts me into such a small box and a box that I actually don't play in very often at all. Yeah. And so I think that that was for me the biggest challenge when I really started down this road of kind of different types of continuing ed is that there's just such a, an assumption made about um, what we do um, that that was the biggest challenge. What are the words that I need to use so people understand that that's not what I do? or this is what I do. Um, and I'm still kind of playing around with that. Yeah, it's a, it's, it can be awkward. You know, they get there with an assumption and then you're like not fulfilling their, their dream of a therapist at all. And they're like, what the hell are you doing? Yeah, and mostly I can, I think as therapists, we learn how to read people, right? Mm -hmm. And there have been many times where I have said, this is not what you came here for, right? Yeah. And people, and I'll say, walk out the door, no problem. I won't bill you. Right. I, I want you to get the care that you want. Or yeah. sometimes I just say, do you want me to just do yeah. a, a regular? Yeah. I like to do yeah. that's regular awesome. massage too, right? Yeah, I think that's something, or that's a conversation that I've had, you know, in break times and other you know seminars, and everyone's got their own little beefs. And some people say, you know, I'm absolutely this, and I'm absolutely that, and it's like, wow. I just don't have that kind of strength of personality or I'm thinking, thank God I don't, you know, but that yeah. you're flexible enough to say, you know, this is my vision or this is how I envision this hour going. But, you know, with what you just said, maybe I need to change. But I, I think that's an awesome answer, though. Yeah. And I think that I think sometimes we have so much conviction about, you know, our way being, you know, the really effective way to go. But and I, I kind of started off a little bit like that because I was influenced by some people who would say things like, oh, yeah, I fire clients or I fire patients if they don't do such and such. And, yeah. and I thought to myself, you know, there's so many times in my life that I haven't been ready, that I haven't been ready to make a change or do something. So why am I going to, yeah. to make someone feel like um, they're less than if all they want is a regular treatment or regular yeah. massage? Yeah. So that's kind of where I come from. Yeah, I get that. Or, you know, just the, the back and forth of saying you, you, you came for this, let's say, kind of pain. Um, and you're asking for, mis, you know, let's say massage. In my opinion, that's not what's going to resolve. Let me, give me five minutes I, I, or go with me on this for a few, you know. Yeah, I think it's healthy and a, and a really healthy approach. What's some... Um, Makes me ask, what's your go-to? Like I, I do, 
I've taken, I don't know, in the last 17 years, <laughs> probably 15 different seminars, you know, and multiple of the same seminar, mm -hmm. multiple levels, or I just didn't get it. So I took it again and again and again. But I, I, I come down to like three basic things. What, what are your go-tos? I would say that my big go-tos are, if I, if I could have a list of three, the three things that I find are always part of my practice and are the most valuable part of my practice are listening. Listening has got to be at the top of my list because more, sometimes more often than in my interventions, people will say, I really felt like you listened to me. Nobody's ever listened to me like that. And I think that that alone has huge power in creating change for people. And then I would say the second thing um, is looking at movement, looking at the way that people move. And that's um, a work in progress. It's been something that I've been working on getting better at. And I think we all work on getting better at it. Um, and manual muscle testing. Manual muscle testing has really kind of changed the way that I practice significantly. Are what are your three things? What's that? What are your three things? Um, in terms of hands-on, it would have to be um, stretching, but yeah. I mean, well, I, my big thing is assessment, assessment, reassessment, reassessment, reassessment within an hour. I'll assess two or three times, but I'll, I, I like the, the way you put it, which is listening. And, and um, I would have to say that part of my assessment is really listening, but also asking questions. But the hands-on would, would be um, NKT. Yeah. Um, just to continue my assessment. And then um, when I find what I need to release through NKT, um, it'll, it'll vary. Uh, the, the most effective, the deepest and all around effective is always going to uh, be stretching for me, the act of stretching. Mm -hmm. um, and then I go back down to something manual, whether it's, you know, I don't know. I, I'll go to massage, super light massage, if they're not ready to touch, or that kind of you know that kind of touch, or myofascial work. Um, but everybody gets energy, you know, work done. And I have tuning forks that are really helpful. Cool. So yeah, it, it, you know, I don't I, I, like you. It's probably hard to, to to narrow it down to three, you know, hands on. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. I think those are really great. Listening and movement. What what is uh, when you do movement? I mean, as a therapy, are you also issuing correctives at the end? Yeah, yeah. yeah I think that's kind of um, where how my practice has changed significantly over the last 10 years yeah. is that it, it really is not um, focused on what happens on the table, although these are table talks. Um, <laughs> it, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> off the table talk. <laughs> um, it really, my, my treatment focus and my, kind of the principles of my care are based on getting people actively involved. Yeah. Um, and so absolutely, people go home with homework um, and, and instructions for how to um, make movement a regular part of their, their yeah. lives. Yeah. I think we had this conversation once when we were in a, in a restaurant and that's a distractingly beautiful setting <laughs> about compliance and how do we get clients um, yeah clients to comply or and you said something um that resonated with me that i hadn't really thought or articulated in that way and i think it was more about keeping it making it easy for them it's not about really compliance because then it's like you're teaching te treating them like a child but it's more about um how did you put that um empowering them just with the knowledge and then it's up to them something like yeah. that and then, you know i don't want it to just hand you know there you go leave me alone it's like really teach them and then you know they'll want to and they'll see the benefit for themselves and they want to continue i think that's really important and, and it, um i think it just now sort of came back into my head that how important that really was so i'm, I'm glad i asked the question yeah yeah i think that compliance i mean i think you can walk kind of a, a thin line there, right? What What is compliance and what is kind of pushing stuff onto people? Yeah. And that never will work. Um, I think that, like you said, through education um, and, and showing people how something can be really effective, you get buy-in, right? And they understand how that can make such a huge difference. And it's not, it doesn't happen in the 
tear sheets of 17 different exercises for knee pain. It yeah. happens in yeah. one or two really focused, effective drills for that individual. Yeah. Um, and if you can find that, man, you can really change things for people. Yeah, that's a pretty good takeaway for me. I think that's my or our job is to decide of those 17 things we could put on a take on a tear sheet, narrow it down to one, like one. Yeah. Maybe two. But yeah. Mm -hmm. And th and then you know explain them. But I think that's a really good point. Did, yeah, did you I, ever? You know, um, sorry, did you have something else? I just think that. Um, you know, I, I hear a lot to people saying, oh, you know, if you're not willing to do this, then you just not bet not you're probably just not wanting to make a, a difference in your pain as much or you're not in enough pain if you're not going to do these 17 exercises and, you know, the excuse of not having enough time means your priorities aren't right. But the truth yeah. is, we're inundated with so many pressures, even before all yeah. this craziness has happened in the world that, you know, it's true. People feel like they don't have time. And whether that's true or not, it doesn't matter. Our job should be working with that individual with the yeah. time that they do have and yeah. giving them important skills to, to change. That's a really good point. Yeah. And I, I, I like the idea that um, I guess we, we can't expect people to change just because they're in pain, change their whole concept of, but they also were in pain. They learned about you or, already knew about you, took the time uh, and um, took action to pick up the phone and actually call you and make an appointment and then show up. I think that's enough of a commitment to start with. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. And if they, if they, if you know, I've got lots of clients like that and I've had, you know, we were talking about people firing their clients because they weren't compliant. Uh, you know, if they want to keep coming back and they say, I just, you know, I probably won't do it, but thank you for the effort. <laughs> Yeah. You bless them and take their money. I'm perfectly comfortable with that. And, yeah. and it not just keeps me busy, but I like the challenge. I like the challenge. Mm. So I, I like that. <laughs> I was going to ask you about um, uh, the symposiums. Have you ever gone to the fascial, uh, the, oh, what do they call it? Uh, something fascia congress, international fascia congress? No, I haven't. But I just actually listened to um, uh, Gil Headley's, uh, uh, yeah. one of his talks. Yeah. Yeah. He's awesome. Yeah, and I, I was never on the fascia train because I, I kind of steer away from the trendy because it annoys me because people just pick up one thing and they just get attached to it like it's the answer for everything. And yeah, so yeah. I'm glad I, I listened to his talk, though. Um, there's some really important things what that came to take away from, from, or which one did you listen to? Was it his most recent one on IT band or was it the fuzz speech? Or? Um, it was a derivative of the fuzz. Yeah, um, it was a fuzz too. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think the big thing that I took from that was the idea um, that fascia was um, a connective tissue or that lymph was a connective tissue and that fascia was kind of part of that. Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, I, I understand fascia. I think that I understand fascia um, fairly well. Um, and I, I really liked that he addressed some of um, the things that he contributed to the misunderstanding of fascia, um, yeah. his whole fuzz stuff. And, yeah. you know, yeah. he recognized that, God, you know, I made some assumptions here and there and, yeah. um, and kind of took that back. And, and that's cool that, that you own that. All we can ever do as practitioners or scientists is, is say, Hey, this is what I think is happening now. And, it was cool to hear him take some of that stuff back and go, yeah. okay, everybody kind of let go of that, please. <laughs> yeah, um, I agree but, with that. I, I've been a huge admirer of, of Gil Headley. I've, I met him one time very briefly, and it was at one of the symposiums, uh, which would happen to be in Vancouver that year. And I happened to be teaching uh, on bookends of, of the internet, uh, that symposium. It did a foundation in, and then an advanced right after it. And, um, it was like drinking from the fire hydrant. It was just like so much information mm. all the time, you know, and even though they were spread out, I think in eight different rooms in this huge hotel, uh, right downtown there, it was the, the, the main room where there was like a thousand, 1200 people, whoever was speaking and often it was a panel. There was just so much information, um, mm. that it was like, 
and it took <laughs> days, if not weeks, to process it. So I was, that's what the, the question is, like, what were your takeaways from that? Because it took me weeks to really come, uh, come up with something that I was able to offer back to my students when I would teach, or, or my clients. When, I, um, yeah. when, when was the Gil Headley thing? Did, was that recent? Or? I just did it online, actually. He had some... Um, he has some online courses available. So I just actually recently looked at it in the last month or two. Yeah, because I guess the question would have been, you know, how it, how had it changed, or how does it change your perception of how you treat? Um, I don't know that it, I don't, oh, okay. Um, actually, one of the things that he drew attention to, and I, I always think that, you know, it's not that we don't know this stuff, it's the, that we just don't recognize the importance maybe of it. And one of the things that he um, was talking about is how a fascia glides in different manners. And so that the superficial fascia glided kind of in one direction and relative to a certain amount of pressure. Mm -hmm. um, where, whereas other deeper fascia um, respond to different types of mechanical strain. And yeah. um, I think that's something that I could definitely take away and kind of build into my practice. Just the recognition that, you know, different depths address in different directions address different types of glide between layers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 I, I had a similar takeaway with that and the hyaluronic acid that was released from diagonal pressure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that. Can mm -hmm. we're, well, we've got like five minutes or so, which is, you know, either both a, a lot of time or no time at all. But, <laughs> Uh, I, I did want to touch on on the the course that you're you're teaching now. I know I want to take it from with, with you from you. <laughs> What's it called? And, and um, we'll, we'll, we'll put a link again with the rest of the information later. So. Yeah, I'm teaching a course that I call sensory motor retraining technique, and so it is really. I have to be honest. It came from me wanting to teach functional anatomy, and I just really wanted because. I saw how much that benefited my practice, being able to understand potentially the implications of one change here and how that affects somewhere else. I wanted to teach my colleagues that. Oh, nice. um, but as a group, um, I think that massage therapists like a kind of a technique-based class. So I threw in a little technique. <laughs> um, but the course really is about um, how to assess movement and then how to use ligaments to change movement or to give you a window of time where you can create strength, improve range of motion, um, and then a set of home care drills. And they can use, be used completely independently of each other or all together, um, but really that's kind of the focus um, of that yeah. class is better understanding functional anatomy so we can make yeah. better choices and critically think a little bit better in practice. I like the home care aspect of it that uh, yeah. the therapists can offer um, another perspective for the, or, or they can learn another perspective that they can offer their clients. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I went all this is over when the confinements and restricted movements um, is over. Uh, I, I would like to take that course with you. So. Well, and you probably will see, because I've taken AIS with you, that there's a lot of similarities, right, with using those reflexes, kind of capitalizing on those spinal reflexes to impart change. And I think that's so, so powerful when we mm -hmm. have a technique that can capitalize on something that is reflexive, that has to happen. If we can tap yeah. into that, it becomes yeah. such a powerful um, you take advantage of the you're you're um, not taking advantage, but um, yeah, you're you're tapping into both the afferent and the efferent nervous system at the same time, and and using that to our advantage. That's mm -hmm. what yeah. Still, I, I, it sounds like a great course, and I, again, I'll put that up at the end. But um, if you, if you had a clinical pearl or something that you wanted to leave people with, uh, you know, uh, uh, could be anything song the dance song. Yeah. an uh, interpretive oh. dance <laughs> um you know when i when i've done this sort of thing i ended up you know offering not just an active stretch but a, something that how how certain movements are attached to the heart line and and recently you know with all of this there's a lot of stress and how you can release the diaphragm and the heart line and just be energetic without even thinking about being energetic so or, or a move or a thought or something that anything that could be of value to people that 
that are either in this situation with us now or when they get back to their clinics or when they want to take a course? Or... Yeah, um, I would say a couple of things. I would say that um, new therapists and just therapists in general, um, uh, some are on this mission to collect menu items to add to their list. And I would really say, you've got all the skills that you need with really your basic training. You just have to master them and really spend your time listening to patients and learning assessment. That's what I would say to new therapists. But I think if I would were to give away like a little tip or trick, um, it would have to be about the foot because I love foot stuff. Mm -hmm. I would say that not all foot pain, pain is plantar fasciitis, and that if you're treating foot pain but not addressing footwear, um, that is a huge limitation. And yeah. so what I would say is, oh, I, I have one here. Um, I would say that if you could look at footwear with your patients who are experiencing foot pain, you will probably get huge results um, associated with that. And one of the things that you can do is you can assess for whether or not their foot allow or their footwear allows them enough room to, to use the foot functionally. And so what I will typically do is I'll like take a shoe, this is my shoe, um, and I'll have people trace it out yeah. and then like come up with, see that, just trace it. Nice. And then um, if you have your patient then put their heel in that tracing and then lift their heel up as if they were to wow. kind of step forward, then you can test whether or not there's enough room in that shoe to allow them to have a functional foot and functional gait pattern. I would say that if you're not doing that already in in your treatment, then absolutely start to look at people's footwear because it can be the thing that prevents you from seeing results. That's that's very clever. Um, I had a question about that. Well, anyway, we're kind of running out of time, but I, I maybe we could do this again and we could do like a, a mini version, a live version going to, to Facebook and, and, and but promote it as something. This is something I would do is that something you do in your course? Yeah. 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 This, that, that maybe promote the course a little bit, but also just, you know, keep our names going uh, and, and post it live to Facebook. Because I only just figured out this afternoon about an hour and a half before I talked to you. <laughs> um, oh, wait a minute. There's a little, once, you know, in the bowels of Zoom, there's this, you know. Is it really? Yeah. There's I'm going to have to learn that. And, oh, my God. I, now, if I, have, if I have to tell somebody where to go to find it, you know, my head will explode. Um, <laughs> Let's do this again, hey? Okay. And we'll do the, the, the foot thing and just a bunch of other things and take like a good 15, 20 minutes of putting a couple of things together. What do you think? Yeah. Oh, that would be awesome. Yeah, so, so fun. Um, thank you, Lori. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, keep you on for a minute, but I'll, I'll pause the recording. You know, sure. Stop the recording. Okay, thanks, everyone.